All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for dropping in and practicing with us uh, this evening or later whenever you're watching the recording on uh, True North Insight YouTube channel. Thanks for checking it out. My name is Jill Davey and I'm one of the Dharma teachers with True North Insight. And uh, summer is officially over. <laughs> it's uh, September now, so it feels like sliding into a different kind of uh, schedule for, for me anyways. It might not feel that way for everybody. Uh, I'll put, um, okay, I'm going to go here. So I was recently listening to CBC Radio, and there was an interview, and I can't remember which program it was or who was interviewing, or even might have been on, might have been on cue, I guess. But um, uh, um, she's a American actor and comedian that uh, named Maria Bamford. And she's written a new book, and they were interviewing her about her work and her book. Uh, and her, I'll put the link um, down below in this recording for her book. And it's here in the Zoom chat. And her book is called Sure, I'll Join Your Cult, A Memoir of Mental Illness and the Quest to Belong Anywhere. I haven't read the book, but um, she's very funny. And she's extremely very open about her personal experience with mental health challenges and struggles and treatments and residential treatments and lots of different 12-step groups and all kinds of stuff. And uh, yeah, so she was in part of this interview, she was joking about one of the being in treatment. It sound, I think it was a residential treatment. Yeah. And um the in the group therapy program the group therapist was reading buddhist quotes or reading passages from buddhist texts and um so she was quipping in this interview that um telling depressed people that life is suffering is not very helpful <laughs> and she's kind of doing it as as a joke, but also it's part of this kind of misrepresentation that is often um, quoted or cited. Um, sometimes the, the, the Buddha said that life is suffering or that Buddhism thinks that life is suffering or think all the variations on that. And um, yeah, not only is that not helpful, to hear when you're in a group therapy for depression, but it's also not um, accurate to what the Dharma teaches and to as far as I've ever read in any of the suttas, um, the um, ancient teachings from the time of the Buddha that um, it, it's, it doesn't say that life is suffering. Um, she went on in the interview at a later time to talk about this book that she wrote and how um, she described writing the book as harder than I thought it was going to be. And I thought, that's a better description of Dukkha. <laughs> um, that of, um, so Dukkha is one of the four ennobling truths, the, the truths that were taught to the noble ones that um, that the Buddha realized on, as part of his awakening, these four ennobling truths. And the first is that part of this, paraphrasing, part of this life experience includes dukkha. And this word dukkha is in Pali, D-U-K-K-H-A, and is the part that is often confused and translated as being suffering. And there, it says right in the Pali English Dictionary, there is no English equivalent to dukkha. Um, it's our 
words are too absolute or too extreme, too strong to capture what what it really means. Uh, so this word dukkha is um, can be broken into its two parts. And the first part, d u, is means bad. And ka, K-H-A, means whole or space or empty. So it's a, a bad space or a bad whole. And what this referred to at the time was the, the axle hole on a wheel of a cart. You know, that the, not that I know anything about car anatomy, but there's like a thing that goes in the <laughs> The wheel has a hole in the center with the axle, I think, um, in that hole. And if the hole, the space, the ka, is badly formed, badly made, is bumpy, is not smooth, is uneven, is off center, that is going to create the experience of dukkha, a bad, a bumpy ride. So it really, it, referred to the this axle hole of like a cart of, and you could imagine like you know no paved roads dirt roads um sometimes yeah uh, you can just imagine what the road would be like and not even a road but the path and sitting in that cart with a badly formed axle hole would be a very uncomfortable ride. Um, and this is actually, so it, 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 dukkha refers to difficulty, to, um, like she said, with writing, a, a, writing the book, harder than I thought it would be. Um, another more accurate translation would be unpleasant or dis-ease not how we use disease like disease but dis hyphen ease unease um unpleasant and so what's important to understand is the second noble truth that dukkha is really the the truth that dukkha comes becomes suffering when craving is added this is the word tanha t-a-n-h-a which is literally translated as thirst it's this thirst this wanting of things to be other than how they are you can i i really like this word thirst like if you on a very hot day, as it has been, um, you can imagine maybe uh, not being not not having water, not having refreshment, and that that how strong that thirst can become, and it can also be very subtle. So it's really to understand that yes, life is unpleasant. Life is bumpy. Life is uh, at times. Um, harder than we think it's going to be and but it's the second noble truth that the real cause of mm, adding a lot more pain to how life is is caused by tanha by clinging um well actually by craving that becomes clinging so this this shows up in uh, wanting something that isn't how it is, wanting something to be different than how it is, but also wanting things to stay how they are. So when things are how we like it and good and everything's going comfortably, there's a craving is can be easily added to want it to stay that way. Who was I talking to recently was talking about that? Yeah. Um, and so I thought it was interesting that in this 
interview, she said both these things, you know, that life is suffering, which is not accurate. Um, life is at times difficult. We don't get to keep what we want to keep. We can't um, get rid of what we want to get rid of. We don't have that much control over life's circumstances. But um, it's really paying attention to when is the craving being added. And of course, not of course, but the third ennobling truth is that when we can see that there's a cause for suffering to arise, for pain to arise, the cause being the craving, clinging, that there can be an ending of that. If we don't add that, then we just can see, oh, it's harder than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> All right. It's harder than I thought it was going to be. And the fourth ennobling truth is the way, the eightfold middle path, the way to the ending of dukkha, the ending of suffering. Um, and even that that phrase is can be really freeing to just drop in, hmm, this is harder than I thought it was going to be. Yep. Okay. And then how do we be there, be with that, with tender attention, kindness, um, wise action, wise speech. This is the whole, takes us into the whole middle path of our wise mindfulness and concentration and wise speech, wise action, wise livelihood, wise effort. I'm not saying them in order, just as they're coming to mind. Um, so these are the places where we respond skillfully to how things are rather than creating more um, suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's all I want to say about that is just to clarify what um, what dukkha means and, and where the real root of the problem lies. And actually in the suttas, the definition of dukkha, let's see. Birth is dukkha, aging is dukkha, death is dukkha, is death, birth, aging, I don't know if sickness is in there. I should have looked it up beforehand. Not getting what we want is dukkha. Not being able to keep what we want is dukkha. And then it ends with, in short, the five aggregates affected by clinging are dukkha. So the five aggregates is the, the Buddha's model, very helpful and liberating of how this perception of me comes to be, the perception of self um, in a painful way. And it says in there, in short, so to sum up all these things that are dukkha, um, and I didn't, I missed some of them, uh, in, but in short, this being affected by clinging is dukkha. So um, that's those, the first and second noble truth coming together there. It's not just that uh, life is suffering. It depends on what we do with it and how we respond to how things are. And uh, part of the skillful means, the skillful path to cultivate the way to the ending of suffering is right mindfulness or wise mindfulness. So it's uh, very important that we practice. And we're, we're so fortunate to be able to practice together and support each other in practicing. So let's uh, adjust our posture and um, get ready for a practice. So you want to, your posture to be 
have a sense of inner dignity, of uprightness, wakefulness, and ease. So see if you need any other um, supports to be able to settle into some sense of inner stillness. Mm -hmm. And then just allowing ourselves to settle into presence, awareness, meeting ourselves where we are. You might like to rest your eyes downward or closed. If there's a lot of sleepiness at this time for you, you might prefer practicing with your eyes open, bringing in some light and uh, presence. And then just feeling into the muscles of the face, noticing if there's any areas of tension. Dukkha is equally mental and physical. So we're taking some time to just notice where are there areas of tension, contraction. Can you let a little bit of space or softness into those tensions? The opposite of dukkha is called sukha, which means ease. So inviting ease into your expression by noticing tension and letting it soften. And allowing the neck to lengthen as the shoulders drop down, feeling their weight. And relaxing all the way down the arms into easeful hands, relaxed hands, hands that are in a posture of letting go in whatever way is comfortable for you. This area of the sides of the neck, the muscles that pull the shoulders up towards the ears can be an area that's showing us physical tension. So just allow that to lengthen as the bones settle down. Now feeling into the areas of the torso, the heart center, the belly center, the back. When we're stressed or experiencing dis-ease or discomfort, the 
muscles of the inner belly can be pulled in, activating our vagus nerve, our fight or flight, freeze response. So see if some softness, ease, relaxing can come to that inner area of the belly close to the spine. It might feel quite foreign to let that soften. So just do as much as you can. And as the upper body relaxes, you might feel more weightedness now through the hips or the back of the body if you're laying down. Hips, legs, feet. And so one of the ways of working with this can be to feel the subtlety of contractions. And notice what happens to them when awareness meets those sensations. Does it let go a little bit? Perhaps it gets more intense for you. Does it soften? Can we have some space around it? Yeah. And I often notice that the areas of habit tension in my body can soften a little bit and then they often slide right back in, such a deep groove. And so I just check in again and soften again. The other aspect we can attend to here is the opposite of dukkha, dis-ease, which is sukha, ease. So notice if there's an aspect of what Rick Hansen calls needs met enough in the moment, in this present moment. Are your needs met enough? In this moment, is there some degree of okayness? And how important it is to recognize that and how does it feel? How does it feel in the body? Where is that sensation? We're so, we may be more attuned to noticing dis-ease can you notice areas of ease, enoughness in this moment? And what's it like to just hang out with that for these next few 
moments? Does it get boring when there isn't something dramatic happening? Do you feel restless or sleepy? Can you just be awake to needs met enough in the moment in an embodied way? Now we're going to cultivate a very gentle, spacious attention. Just feeling breath is happening in the area of the chest as a whole. A whole band of awareness, left and right, above and below, front and back inner and outer in a spacious, gentle way, resting. Breath is happening. Very lightly, spaciously with the chest as a whole experience. And can you notice the experience of ease or sukha with this? If it creates dis-ease, dukkha, you might open your eyes or choose a different, more spacious anchor like hearing. Noticing if any habit tensions have crept in again and inviting some space and softness with that as we feel the chest as a whole breathing.
If you notice any hindrances like desire, wanting to do something else, aversion, not liking how something is in your environment, in the body, in the mind. If there's restlessness or sleepiness or doubt, see if you can just name it as being harder than you thought it was, harder than you thought it was going to be. Without adding craving, tanha. If you feel some steadiness, resting with the breath in the area of the chest as a whole, you might like to expand the awareness a little bit wider into this space around the chest, around the body, still aware of the sensation of breath in this area side to side, front and back, inner, outer, above, below. Softly resting awareness with that sensation as we feel the space around. And you can choose how large that space becomes. Spacious, awake awareness. And that's wide and calm enough to know the discomfort as it arises and passes. A bumpy ride, harder than I thought it would be.
Noticing any subtle tension, habit tensions that may have crept in with thoughts or sensations. This is sometimes described as the granularity of it. It's very subtle forms of craving. These last few minutes of practice are often the most fruitful as hindrances start to arise a little more. Restlessness, sleepiness, aversion, etc. So begin again. Breath, whole chest, worth the space beyond that.
And I'll just add that um, I heard Gil, no, it was Rick Hansen uh, saying that liking and wanting are uncoupled in the brain, are neurologically not the same thing. Liking and wanting or not liking and not wanting. So they're just because we like something or want um, that like something or don't like something, pleasant, unpleasant, does not have is is a different experience than wanting and not wanting. And this is that second noble truth of tanha of um, craving. So thank you for joining us. Uh, for this practice tonight and hope to share practice with you again.